A California assemblyman steps down after allegations of sexual misconduct. We've been doing this so many years, and to be honest with you, we really don't have that many issues. People are just really happy and grateful to be here. Hundreds of homeless San Diegans are expected to move off the streets and into industrial tents in the coming weeks as the city takes the next steps in addressing the homeless and hepatitis A crises. And a there was a big culture shift, not only with the students, but with the faculty as well. And big changes ahead for the UC San Diego Tritons. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. A California assemblyman resigned today following sexual misconduct allegations that include groping and kissing multiple women. So far, Raul po Boca Niegra is the only lawmaker to leave office amid numerous harassment reports at the state capitol. The Los Angeles Democrat did not admit to doing anything wrong, but says he decided to quit now instead of waiting until the end of his term so his district can get a new representative in place sooner rather than later. In the state Senate, another Los Angeles Democrat who is under investigation for sexual misconduct has been stripped of a committee chairmanship. In an emergency session today, the state Senate Rules Committee voted to remove Tony Mendoza as chair of the Insurance, Banking and Financial Institutions Committee. Atkins, aye. Berryhill, Leva. Aye. Leva, aye. Canella. Aye. Canella, aye. De Leon. Aye. De Leon, aye. Okay, motion passes on a four to zero vote. There was no discussion on the vote and lawmakers avoided reporters following the hearing. De Leon released a statement later in the day saying, our state Senate must stop sweeping workplace misconduct under the rug and do everything we can to protect women who work in and around the Capitol. Sexual harassment at the state capitol is the subject of a series of public hearings that start tomorrow in Sacramento. An assembly a subcommittee is evaluating the anti-harassment policies already in place and is looking for ways to strengthen them. More than 150 women who work at the capitol signed on to a campaign in October highlighting what they say is a culture of pervasive harassment. Backers of an initiative to repeal the recent gas tax increase kicked off a signature gathering campaign today in San Diego. Campaign supporters are challenging the notion that an increase in the gasoline excess excise tax and vehicle registration fees will lead to better roads and highways and bridges and public transportation. The Secretary of State's office says Repeal signatures must be submitted by January 8th to qualify the measure for the November 2018 ballot. San Diegans gathered today to protest the recent tax plan passed by Republicans in the House. The $1.5 trillion plan would include repealing several funding tools for affordable housing. KPBS video journalist Katie Shulove has more. 63-year-old Gisela Mayworm became homeless when her husband lost his job in 2011. Anyone can be homeless. Anyone can face challenges. Today, Mayworm lives in Celadon, an affordable housing complex in downtown San Diego. 2015, when I learned that I was moving here, I couldn't believe. And then my first Christmas in my small studio, I, I was with my family. Mayworm Studio is one of more than 10,000 affordable rental units in San Diego that were created or preserved with help from low-income housing tax credits. These credits would be repealed if the House tax reform plan proceeds unchanged. It's truly a heartless administration in Congress. State Senator Ben Hueso says that could further exacerbate San Diego's homelessness crisis. There would be over 10,000 families in the city of San Diego that would be without a home today had it not been for this program that's about to be cut. This is a tragedy and we need everybody's help out there to lift their phone and call your congressperson and demand for them not to support this measure. The Senate is hoping to pass its tax overhaul plan in the coming weeks. Katie Shulev, KPBS News. 
Over the next several weeks, San Diego plans to open three large tent structures to house 700 homeless people. One of the tents will be dedicated to children and families, including dozens of children currently living at the city's homeless campground. KBBS reporter Susan Murphy has more. Nobody was expecting 50 children and their parents at the city's temporary homeless campground. That's why this time they're prepared. Father Joe's Villages will be operating a tent dedicated to families in a gated parking lot on its property. It will have beds and cribs for 150 people. We'll receive all the families that are in the campground and then we think there's still more out there. Chief Program Officer Ruth Bruland with Father Joe's Villages says they're expecting many more babies, children and their parents because of what they're seeing at their other shelters. We know that our waiting list for the Family Living Center is months and months long. So there are families out there and we'll be ready to serve them. Bruland says Father Joe's is the most ideal location for the family tents because it's already equipped for children. We sometimes at, at our village and our regular buildings have up to 160 kids at a time. So we're used to all that kid activity. Inside the tent will be a kid-friendly area and right next door is a therapeutic care center and licensed child care facility. So that's where we'll really want them to go because then we can help them if they're behind in school, we can help them get caught up in school. It's just a great place to be safe, to play, and to learn. Brulin says having 150 additional people on campus will be a challenge. The child care programs have limited capacity. So do the dining halls where three daily meals are provided. Yeah, we know we're going to have to extend the hours to serve everybody. The tent is set to open in late December. Brulin says they'll work hard to provide the best care possible. A tent isn't an ideal situation, so as, as quickly as we can, we'll move people from our, the tent into our regular structure. A couple blocks away, on 16th Street and Newton Avenue is where a second tent will provide 350 beds for men and women. It will be run by the Alpha Project. Amy Gagno is chief operating officer. We have women in the front and then we have barriers between the two sections and men in the back. The nonprofit operated the city's winter tent program for two decades. It's currently managing the city's homeless campground in Golden Hill, which opened in September for 200 people. Gagno says a step-down plan to close the campground is underway. So that we can take the singles that are over there and they can come over here so there's not that lapse in service. The large tent is scheduled to open on December 1st. In addition to the campers, priority will be given to people with housing vouchers in hand. Housing navigators will be on site to help people cycle through the tent more quickly and secure a permanent place to live. It's going to become a lot more efficient and easier and less frustrating for both the client that's living on a street, which are transient, so you can't really, sometimes you can't find them. Um, so this will provide that spot for people to come and, and see their people and work with them and get them out. Also on site, an abundance of services, including health care and counseling, will help people gain stability, including those with drug and alcohol addictions. We don't want any barriers to entry here. We just want to help them. So once they get in and they have some issues, we engage and engage and engage and try to get them either they need a treatment facility or, or whatever needs they have. The site also includes bathrooms, showers, laundry facilities and 24-hour security. Two meals will be served each day. People can bring their service animals and two bags filled with belongings and they can come and go as they please, but a strict curfew will be in place. We have bed check at 8 o'clock at night, every night. Those who don't check in on time will lose their bed that night. So we're not going to leave a bed open. We'll go out at night and go and, and get somebody that wants to come in. Gagno says 350 people are a lot to fit under one roof, but she's not worried. We've been doing this so many years, and to be honest with you, we really don't have that many issues. People are just really happy and grateful to be here. Candace Gardner-Smith and her husband, a Marine, Terry Marcel Smith, are hoping to get into one of the tents. I have been diagnosed with schizophrenia and depression. The married couple has been homeless and living on the streets around downtown for several years. Me and my wife need a roof over our head so we can succeed in life. Elizabeth Saylor hopes she'll get in too. She says she's desperate for a place to sleep. Um, a bed, a safe environment that's drug free and that would be important too especially if I was uh, trying to be clean. A homeless count taken in January found more than 5,600 people in the county sleeping on the streets. Susan Murphy, KPBS News.
A third tent dedicated to 200 veterans and operated by Veterans Village of San Diego will be located on Sports Arena Boulevard. It's scheduled to open late December or early January. Clean water advocates in San Diego are getting a boost from California fishing groups who are hoping to improve water quality around the state. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has the story. San Diego Coast Keeper is one of three clean water groups that sued the state at the beginning of the month. The others are Los Angeles Water Keeper and the Earth Law Center. Now, San Diego Coast Keeper Matt O'Malley says the groups want to make sure that the state complies with federal clean water rules by doing a better job of identifying and listing impaired waterways. O'Malley says state officials are not up to date and that's stopping work on polluted waters. It includes all water bodies. In particular, uh, our groups you know, are looking at some of the river waterways, but it streaks uh, streams, creeks, uh, lakes, uh, rivers. It could even be um, bays and, and even out to the ocean. O'Malley says listing a waterway as impaired is a step toward fixing any environmental problems that might be in there. He says the state is not listing impaired waterways in a timely manner and officials are using outdated information. Now, several pro fishing groups are working on a similar legal action and they'll join the Clean Water Group Challenge. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. California is requesting billions in federal federal disaster relief money for the Northern California wildfires, but so far the state has received nothing. A recent disaster aid bill included $44 billion, mostly for hurricane relief. Democrat Congressman John Garamendi says he believes California is being left out due to politics. Wherever you are, you're an American. You've been harmed in a natural disaster. We're all going to do the very best we can to come to your aid and get you back on your feet. Congress reconvenes tomorrow. Garamendi says he and the rest of the California delegation will push to make sure funding for wildfire victims is included in a new disaster relief bill. The California Supreme Court handed a victory today to organize farm labor in the state. The court upheld a law that aims to ensure labor contracts from farm workers whose unions and employers don't agree on wages and other working conditions. The fight pitted one of the largest fruit farms in the nation against the union started by iconic labor leader Cesar Chavez. The fruit company says it plans to appeal the ruling. A nationwide shortage of small IV bags has forced hospitals in San Diego to come up with other options. As KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg explains, the disruption was caused by the September hurricane that devastated Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria left Puerto Rico bruised, battered, and largely without power or communications. The island is home to a number of pharmaceutical factories, including one of the major manufacturers of small saline bags. These products are widely used to administer drugs and hydrate hospital patients. Dr. Angela Socha is chief medical officer of UC San Diego Health. She says clinical staff are using larger IV bags and other products as a workaround. But the shortage has been a wake-up call. The need to have redundancy in the supply system has become very apparent. And I don't think it was clear to many of us that our supply was this vulnerable. Socia says patient care has not been adversely affected. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. California is doing better than most states when it comes to the opioid crisis, but more needs to be done. That's the consensus among health experts at an event today in Sacramento. Doctors credit California for reducing the rate of opioid prescriptions and increasing the number of addiction treatment centers. In California, we've made amazing strides. The death rate in California has been flat for two years. It hasn't gone down, which we need it to happen, but it also, unlike the rest of the U.S., isn't steadily climbing. And we do believe that's because across the state, we've been working to lower prescribing rates by getting doctors like me to treat pain differently and more safely. More than 33,000 people died from opioid abuse and overdoses in 2015. That's a tenfold increase from 2012. 2,000 of those deaths occurred in California. After a nine news source investigation last month revealed questions about finances at San Diego Christian College, a school official has confirmed it has a new interim chief financial officer. I news source reporter Megan Wood has details. 
An official in the president's office at San Diego Christian told iNewsource on Monday that Steve Cheney is no longer the college's chief financial officer. She declined to comment on the reasons behind the change, but in its earlier investigation, iNewsource found that the private nonprofit college in Santee couldn't account for more than $20 million in expenses. They were reported by Cheney as other in its public tax returns. He said he would provide iNewsource with details of these expenses, but never did. Tim Savaloya of Minnesota is now the interim chief financial officer. He's also vice president of San Diego Christian's Board of Trustees. For KPBS, I'm iNewsource reporter Megan Wood. iNewsource is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. A first for Cyber Monday. More people are buying on mobile devices than on desktop computers. The research firm Adobe Analytics also reports Cyber Monday sales are up nearly 20 percent. Nearly half of those orders are made via Amazon. The company has hired 120,000 seasonal workers to help fulfill orders. Electronics and toys are the top sellers. Online sales are expected to reach six billion dollars from Thursday through Monday. It's official. UC San Diego Athletics is becoming an NCAA Division I program. It means the Tritons will be able to compete athletically with top schools around the country. KVBS reporter Matt Hoffman has more. Thank you all for being here as we celebrate a landmark announcement. UC San Diego's move to Division I Athletics. UC San Diego, known for its academics and research, is joining the athletic ranks of San Diego State and the University of San Diego. There is a big culture shift, not only with the students, but with the faculty as well. UCSD will transition to NCAA Division I as part of the Big West Conference, joining UC Davis, UC Irvine, and Cal State Fullerton, among other schools. We can uh, start creating some natural rivalries, because when you look at the UCs, they're all great institutions. In May 2016, students approved raising athletic fees by $480 to pay for additional staff, equipment, and scholarships associated with the transition. For them, I, th I think it's a culmination of you know a lot of a lot of work. We have some uh, some returners on the team that were here when we passed the student referendum, and so you know their excitement to to kind of have this come to fruition for us. The move to Division One will take some time, though. UCSD says men's volleyball will start playing in the new conference this next season and all sports will be transitioned by 2020. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. I'm William Brangham. Tonight on the News Hour, Republicans rush to pass their tax plan as accusations of sexual misconduct continue to cloud the Capitol. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. Rain and colder weather around the county today, and it seems like San Diegans enjoyed their walks, rain or shine. But should we keep our umbrellas out longer? Regina Miller has the forecast. Well, we had some uh, clouds and a bit of rain around the area, which is clearing out. And as we go into tomorrow, we're going to see a return to some of the Santa Ana winds that is going to uh, bring some dry weather. And also, uh, we have a gusty breeze in the forecast. We widen the view out, and you can see how that system kind of rotates onto the east. And we've had the clouds and showers clearing out of most of the area as well. And for tonight, we just have a clear sky with an overnight low of 50 degrees in the metro areas. Into uh, Ocean Oceanside will be at 39 degrees. In uh, Mount Laguna, 37. Borrego Springs is at 46 degrees. You have a clear night in store there. Chula Vista is at 48 degrees. And we do have a gusty breeze. They'll be out of the northeast about 35 miles per hour, but they could gust a bit higher than that. And so we have a cooler interior, but as we head to the coastline here, into Oceanside will be at 72 degrees. Chula Vista is at 74. San Diego. 71 degrees and in Borrego Springs 75 degrees there for tomorrow as we look at the coast forecast here we're going to have a partly sunny sky it's going to be in the low 70s for Tuesday Wednesday partly sunny 72 Thursday mostly sunny and nice at 74 it warms up just a little bit more for Friday and then partial sunshine for Saturday by the time we get to Sunday there might be a little bit of rain coming back into the area inland areas you'll be in the upper 70s with some sunshine warm 
warmer on Tuesday here. Wednesday's at 78 and partly sunny. Mostly sunny, 82 degrees for Thursday. Friday, we're at 83 and just a little bit cooler, 78 degrees for Saturday. In the mountain locations, 58 degrees with plenty of sunshine for your Tuesday. 57 and partly sunny on Wednesday. We'll be at 60 degrees on Thursday and 63 by Friday with some sunshine in the forecast as well. 75 for Tuesday and Wednesday in the desert with periods of sun, mostly sunny and nice. 79 degrees on Thursday, 80 degrees by Friday, and we're back to 79 on Saturday. I'm Regina Miller, KPBS News. It may have been cloudy and cool today, but San Diego's typical sunny and warm weather may make kids here friendlier and more outgoing. This according to a study published in Nature Today. It found all other things being equal, kids raised in warmer climates are significantly more likely to be agreeable, open, and emotionally stable compared to kids raised in colder climates. Researchers at the University of Georgia find warmer weather impacts mood and behavior. Warmer weather encourages outdoor and pro-social activities. A San Diego group received national praise for its annual event to inform the public about the law. KBBS reporter Taryn Minto has details. Known as Law Day, the educational events take place around the country each spring to inform residents about their rights. This year, the celebration at the San Diego Public Library branch in City Heights was number one. The American Bar Association honored it this month with the Best Public Program Award. We have been told by the branch manager that they're still getting phone calls regularly asking, you know, when are the lawyers coming back? Co-organizer Araceli Martinez says she was thrilled to receive the national honor, which commended the event's diverse programming and one-on-one -on -one legal consultations. So we had family law, we have immigration, um, landlord-tenant, we had... Uh, um, criminal. I mean, any question that anybody had, there was somebody on hand to answer it. The ABA also applauded its efforts to provide not only information, but kids' activities, job opportunities, a cultural performance, discussions with elected officials, and translations in multiple languages. The City Heights event will be listed as a best practice in the ABA's 2018 Law Day planning materials. Martinez says this year's event drew 1,100 participants, but she hopes next year will bring in even more people. Definitely going to go bigger. It's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. We're already planning it. We've been meeting since, since September. Next year's City Heights Law Day is set for April 28th. National Law Day was established in 1968. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. No tip for the delivery driver? No problem. AP reporter Mike Householder says Domino's and Ford are teaming up to see if customers will warm to the idea of pizza delivered by driverless cars. It's a scene that plays out in college towns across America. A student orders pizza and it's delivered a short time later. The difference here is that no one's driving this car. At least that's what the pizza buyers believe. I just got a call after my order, like, your order will be delivered by a driverless car. I'm like, oh, exciting. I want to see that. <laughs> Domino's and Ford are teaming up to see if customers will warm to the idea of pizza delivered by autonomous vehicles. Delivery is a really important part of who we are. And autonomous vehicles are a technology that's coming. So it's really important that we understand how this new upcoming technology is going to impact our business in the future. Ford, which plans to introduce a fully driverless vehicle in 2021, Input the last four digits of your phone number. also wants to understand the kinds of scenarios for which companies would use it. The Domino's heat wave container is open. You can safely... So the automaker worked with Domino's to set up the experiment in the pizza company's hometown of Ann Arbor, Michigan sending out on deliveries a fusion hybrid autonomous research vehicle, complete with LIDAR, radar, and camera sensors. A Ford engineer sits behind the wheel of the fusion, oh my gosh. but the front windows are blacked out so customers won't interact with him. They can track the vehicle using GPS all the way to their location, and then they walk out to the car. Hello. Yay. Okay, what are the last four digits of mommy's phone number? They enter in the four-digit code, and basically it reveals this pizza compartment opens, and the uh, pizza is there, and they take their pizza, and they walk away. Test subject Teresa Hatcher says she sees value in the technology. I think it would be cool. It would probably be safer um, 
to a certain extent in the future. I know there's a lot more research that needs to be done, but that could be one of the benefits. The experiment is designed to give insights into how customers interact with a self-driving car. Will customers come out to the car? Do they want to actually come out and retrieve their own pizza? Are they willing to go through the process of typing in a digit? Do they understand it? Is it really clear? What are the other what ifs? Like what other kind of things can happen? Now that the six week long testing period has run its course, the companies say they'll dig through the data before making a call about the future of driverless pizza deliveries. Right. Mike Householder, Associated Press, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Have a delicious day. Have a delicious day. From Hollywood to Buckingham Palace. Today, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry announced their royal engagement. Markle is an American actress. Prince Harry of Wales was born Meghan's under an Meghan's international Meghan's spotlight as the youngest child of Prince Charles and the late Princess Diana. Harry reveals Markle's engagement ring contains diamonds from his mother's ring. The pair say they met on a blind date 18 months ago. Harry is fifth in line to the British throne. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.